Good afternoon. So I'd like to begin with this question, which is, is that all that there is to cabaret? Which is obviously a bit of a trick question, for the answer is a resounding no. But before we lay out all the arguments, a story. So the first time that I heard European cabaret, it raised the hair on the back of my neck straight up. It was about 10 years ago, and I had just purchased a CD set of recordings of Berlin's Jewish cabaret artists from before the Holocaust. I had no idea at the time what drove me to buy this particular set. Just a hunch, a gut. A few minutes into listening, a funny little Spretzinger, or patter song, came on, and that's when it happened. The hair stood up, because I somehow knew the rest of the song. Now, I don't speak German, and I definitely had never heard the song in question. But what I experienced at that moment was the keenest and most sharp sense of deja vu, which I have ever felt before or since. And as I would advise any of you to do, should such a moment come upon you, I sat up, I took note, and then I dove headfirst into the vast world of European Jewish cabaret. So in a nutshell, here is how we can define European cabaret. First of all, it's an intimate venue, enormous venue where you can't necessarily feel the beads of sweat of the MC flick off onto your drink, that's not cabaret. Food and drink, almost always served in European cabaret venues. I'm talking about venues up through the 40s and 50s. Thirdly, MC, the, the institution, the creation of a master of ceremonies or conferencière. Obviously, many of us think of Joel Gray when we think of the ultimate conferencière. That was a creation of cabaret, someone who would speak directly to the audience, who might give political diatribes, who might insult you, who might seduce you, who might simply introduce the next act, a kind of guide to what was going on on stage. That was new in the art form of cabaret. Fourthly, fourth, I think is the word, political satire. Throughout all the many countries where cabaret travels, political satire is at the heart of what's going on. Fifth, it's what I'd call shifting tectonic plates, meaning that it's not a through line narrative art form. They're not going for coherence. They're not going for consistency. They're not trying to tell one story. What they're doing instead, and this goes through in the cabarets across Europe and Tel Aviv, is they're lining up different, what I'd call tectonic plates, emotions, artistic styles, attitudes. They bump up against each other. In this way, a sort of odd hodgepodge mosaic is created, which is the cabaret's evening as a whole. In a sense, it's anti-narrative. Sixth, it's very current material. It's all topical. Okay, if it's, once it gets a little old, they might rewrite it or they toss it out, which is why when someone like me mines archival cabaret material, a lot of what I encounter is interesting historically, but I wouldn't put it on stage because either it doesn't communicate to us today or it's not very good because they created an awful lot fast. And lastly, it's a child of modernism, just like Bauhaus, psychoanalysis, Dada. It springs out of that same modernist world and attitude. So where does it start? European cabaret starts. First cabaret is Le Chat Noir, 1881, Paris. This is a poster that many of you may recognize, the evil black cat, right? Instead of crossing the road to get away from it, you're going to cross the road and come inside the cabaret to be right next to that evil black cat. What's Jewish about cabaret, though? Right, the million dollar question. Well, first of all, an overwhelming number of Jews participate in European cabaret, from particularly in Berlin, where we're taught that over 80% of the cabarettists, from the set designers through the lyricists, were said to be Jews, but also in many other cities that I'm already mentioned. Secondly, this art form draws its roots not only from such sister art forms that we might all think of, like variety and vaudeville and burlesque, but also from the Yiddish theater, also from the Purimspiel, which is an incredible 
legacy in and of itself. And finally, from the traditional wedding badchen or wedding jester, which we used to have before the Holocaust at almost any Ashkenazi wedding in Eastern Europe. Nextly, it, next, it's an art form which thrives on an outsider's vision. If you're too much inside the society, it's pretty hard to say anything ironic. Not that all Jews felt like outsiders, but a heck of a lot of them did. Also, it's an art form which thrives on questions much more than answers that get, got it into trouble with people who wanted straight political answers, like don't just make fun of the situation, but tell us what to do and go there. That is not cabaret. That's inherent, actually not satire inherently. Also, it's uh, lastly, easily transportable art form, meaning that it migrates across Europe wherever Jews go. Why? Because the sets are co compact, it's cheap, it's easily portable. You got a song, it's talking about problems in one place, you rewrite the lyrics the next day and you talk about problems somewhere else. That's inherent in an art form like this. So, Let's return, though, to the cabaret artists themselves. Here, in quick succession, are just a few of the faces and the pictures which haunt me to this day. First of all, here is Trude Hesterberg in Berlin, 1929, performing a Friedrich Hollander song called The Ballad of the Stock Exchange, which, with a bunch of fat cat capitalists behind her and lots of money signs all over her dress. This is a shot of different cabaret artists and writers who together formed a group in Tel Aviv. In the front left with the kind of eraser head hair is Shlonsky, the great poet who was sort of uh, modeled himself as a rival of Bialik and of the force of a new Israeli voice. He was also quite active in the cabarets. But haunting faces aside, why do I believe in this material? Why do I wish to encourage all of you to fall in love with it as I have? Because music and satire can be powerful forces for social change. And these 1920s and 30s cabaret artists knew that in their bones. Perhaps this is something which in our confusing and politically correct age we have a bit forgotten. But the artists whose photos I just showed you, they didn't forget. They fought for a better world through their songs as well as through their actions. I recently spent a day searching the web for newly penned topical songs, monologues, or comedic sketches which take the piss out of the current economic crisis, both in Europe and in the US. Shockingly, I found almost nothing. Of course, certainly, there are a few brave, mad geniuses out there who are singing truth to power, but not tons of them. And where are the Tom Lehrers of the Occupied movement? Where is the national bailout song we're all whistling, despite our politics, just because it's so catchy? Why didn't I find a million songs about the insidious temptation of credit card debt or urban food deserts? or the injustices of international water conservation. It seems to me that we're in a huge pickle as a planet these days, and what we need most is creative vision, freeing our minds from stale thinking, from routine blindness, in order to see solutions in place of hopelessness. As it turns out, satire is one of the best ways to clean the schmutz off your eyes and help you to think creatively. And as it turns out, satire, particularly musical satire, is a vital part of our legacy as Jews. For this reason, I encourage you to look to European cabaret for inspiration. Who knows? It may just help you to laugh your way into a better world. And at the same time, I want to encourage those of you who write music or lyrics to pen some new political or social satire songs. In fact, I challenge you, if you write them, I will perform them. Which brings me to the title of this lecture, Poison Cookie. That's what composer Friedrich Hollander called cabaret, a cookie you eat without thinking. It goes down sweet and yummy, and only then it explodes like an existential bomb in your stomach. That's what cabaret does best. And that's why I choose, or I chose, to close with 
this ferocious cabaret song from Yiddish Warsaw in 1937. The song was written in response to the Polish government's short-lived plan to cart off all the Jews of Poland, not to the Promised Land, no, but instead to Madagascar. Seriously. So they sent a fact-finding mission to Africa in 1937, only to discover that there were natives living there already. So the plan is shelved. But in the cabarets of Warsaw, they get a wind of this, and they go bananas. And uh, they create an extremely not politically correct song, Know That, which I shall present to you. Now finally, about this. So in the cabarets of Yiddish Warsaw, it was quite typical, these cosmopolitan young hipster Jews, to make fun of their Hasidic brothers and sisters. So that's one reason for this hat. But there's actually a deeper reason for the hat, which is that it's really interesting to me to, as I'm about to do, perform this song from, from this Hasid's point of view. Let him get the say, which he never got to in reality. Let him get the say inside of the cabarets about his attitude towards this governmental policy. So I here present you with the 1937 Warsaw Yiddish cabaret hit, Oi Madagascar. <laughs> Blizzards, I'll be hunting lizards, koshering their gizzards, dancing night and day. Hi, Madagascar. It's like a schwitz, but out of doors, even so, we will enjoy Madagascar. There's no attack, cause all those black guys run around in draws. They'll show me how to swim, it will be easy to enjoy. They are at half as primitive as any Polish guy. Madagascar, forget the Jordan, you're the promised land. Hi, 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 hi. I'll find me a queen of Sheba, the red kinky hair, slithering like an amoeba in her underwear. With no cops to book us, she will shake her toe. From Hanukkah to circus, life without a care. They Madagascar, just like a Tarzan, I will swing with my charcoal chicks away. Madagascar, on my divan, I'll eat bananas and frolic like a king. With elephants and rhinos, I will pass the time of day. Then no one laughs at my nose, and my life is always gay. Madagascar, forget that Jordan, you're the problem. We will build a sanctuary. Such a righteous task with a pool that's sanitary. Mikva Madagask. Clientele with diners, Shabbos candles shine. Natives pouring wine there before you even ask. Hey, I'm my boy, 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 Polish gates are shut. Just nail up a mezuzah on the entrance to your hut. No blizzards, just lizards. A tukis for circus. Promised land in the sand, going black in my shack, roaming free up a tree. That's for me. Hi! Thank you.